Well, hello, everyone. My name is Luke Busta. I'm a new assistant professor at the University of Minnesota Duluth. And today I'll tell you a bit about some of the work that I did as a postdoc in Nebraska on sorghum, particularly in comparison with corn. <clears throat> and in this work, uh, we looked at uh, sort of both the, the, the genome level as well as uh, at the sort of metabolite level. In particular, we looked at leaf wax chemistry. And I'll go into that in more detail as we go along here. But first, some introductory information. <clears throat> you know, for plants, retaining water is a challenge, right? They have these large surface areas that they use to collect sunlight. But because they have those large surface areas, they can also lose lots of water across those surface areas via transpiration. And so this, of course, is a challenge for plants, how to find a balance between these two things. A large surface area is to collect sunlight, but not so large, or at least some manner to protect those surface areas so that they don't lose water. And of course, understanding how plants strike that balance or meet that challenge is a critical step towards the next generation of drought tolerant crops. If we can understand that, then perhaps we can modify that balance or modify those traits in crop species. Right, <clears throat> so you may know that plants have a strategy to deal with this balance. They retain water inside their leaves and stems with a waxy coating. So virtually all land plants have this. They are protecting themselves against transpirational water loss with this waxy coating called the cuticle. And you can see a diagram of the cuticle here on the slide. And there are a variety of things in this diagram. <clears throat> We're not going to go into them into too much detail, but what I want you to see is that there is an epidermal cell here in blue. It's the epidermal cells that synthesize the components that make up the cuticle. There's a few different metabolic processes, these white arrows and text here that relate to fatty acids as well as isoprenes. And we'll talk more about those structures in just a moment. But basically, these processes inside the epidermal cells create molecules that are exported outside the cell. They pass through the cell wall, and they accumulate here on the surface of the plant. And there are really two different kind of components to them, right? There is, um, oopsie, there are sort of two components. One is shown here in pink, and the other is in black. The black is this kind of matrix. It's a polyester matrix called cutin. And it's the scaffold on top of which and within which these wax molecules are, uh, or I should say these wax molecules accumulate. And so the wax molecules accumulate on top the cutin matrix and inside of it. And it's the wax that seals the surface against water loss. <clears throat> so from analyses of a variety of plants, waxy barriers, what we've learned is that some plants have these cuticles that are more waterproof than others. But we don't really understand why this is or how this is. Is this some feature of their chemistry? Is it something about how these uh, structures are arranged, their organization in space? We don't really know. <clears throat> but of course, as I mentioned earlier, understanding that is part of under, you know, advancing our understanding of wax structure and fun function, understanding that is part of understanding how plants are balancing having these large surface areas with losing water. And thus, this understanding is a key to um, creating crops with enhanced drought tolerance, right? And of course, <clears throat> I think we're all you know, aware of why drought tolerant crops are important. Uh, as folks in the Midwest here, we just experienced a really intense drought this summer. So of course, having crops that can withstand that sort of thing without too much damage, um, you know, it's going to be important for our future. Right. So studies so far have shown that this waxy barrier on the surface of the plant, <clears throat> it can be made up of a variety of chemicals. Usually, so on most plant species, this waxy barrier is made of these compounds here, these aliphatic compounds there. They kind of look like fatty acids. And on some species, so they're sort of less common. So just on, on some that we, that we see, uh, their waxy layers are made up of these types of compounds here. These are called allocyclic compounds. And so you can see they have these like cyclic rings in them, right? So allocyclic and aliphatic. And there's some evidence that these allocyclic 
rich wax layers are more watertight at high temperatures, like under hot, arid, dry conditions, right? <clears throat> Whereas, relatively speaking, these aliphatic rich uh, wax barriers might be less watertight at high temperature. So there's some evidence for this in the literature, and it seems like there might be a structure function relationship here, but a structure function relationship here, but we're not entirely sure about that yet, but it's intriguing. Um, let's go through some examples. So for example, uh, a maize leaf here is on this end of the spectrum. It has an aliphatic rich cuticle. So it's got lots of um, fatty acid like molecules on the surface of its leaves. And so for this project, one of the first things we wanted to do, because we, there are lots of comparisons of this type going on, <clears throat> where it was to compare uh, the maize leaf wax characteristics with that of sorghum. So sorghum, which is a relative of maize that's relatively drought tolerant, uh, where does it lie on this spectrum? Where do sorghum's leaves lie? Are they here on the aliphatic rich end or on the alicyclic rich end or somewhere in the middle maybe? So we kind of tried to figure this out. This is how this project began. So we started by taking sorghum leaves from a bunch of different plants um, of the same genotype, but of different ages. And we pooled those leaves together and we extracted the waxes. And then we kind of pre-separated the different wax molecules with this technique called thin layer chromatography. And then we analyzed each of those sort of pre-separated um, fractions, we call them. So like pre-separated subsets with gas chromatography and mass spectrometry. That's what GCMS stands for. And what we found were these seven fractions here. So we have one fraction that contains alkanes, a fraction that contains aldehydes, several fractions that contain these allocyclic compounds, a variety of different structures, and then some, com uh, some fractions that contain, again, more um, aliphatic compounds, as well as some other structures that we see down here. So this was interesting. This means that sorghum has both these aliphatic wax compounds, kind of the typical ones that we see on a lot of plant species, but it also has these unusual wax compounds, these allocyclic compounds. In particular, it has these isotritrypanoid structures, um, the, this, uh, this isoprene unit, or I should say this, um, uh, this iso uh, substituent here is sort of unusual. So these are sort of some unusual, even among triterpenoids, these compounds. So this was interesting. The next thing that we wanted to know was that, you know, we've seen in some species, in, including in maize, that there can be changes in leaf wax chemistry over the course of a plant's development. We wanted to know if this is happening in sorghum, because our goal here initially was just to do kind of a deep dive into sorghum's wax, chem wax chemistry to see what's going on and to compare it with maize. And so what we did was we took waxes from juvenile plants two to three weeks after they'd been planted and waxes from adult plants, plants that had long since gone through the juvenile to adult transition. And we compared those. And what we saw was that on juvenile plants, wax coverage was much higher than on adult plants, about twice as high. So the juvenile plants have more wax and they have primarily these alcohol compounds. These are aliphatic compounds with the long tails. Whereas the adult leaves, though they have less wax, they have primarily these triterpenoid compounds. <clears throat> these are the allocyclic compounds with the rings. And so it seems like there's some sort of shift, right? Um, from juvenile leaves, they have more wax per surface area uh, and they have mainly alcohols, but then there's a shift to these adult leaves that have less wax and primarily these triterpenoids. And we have detailed information about exactly which alcohols and exactly which triterpenoids were found. I, I refer you to the paper if you want to look at that in detail. But the important point here is that there is a shift uh, from the sort of leaves made by plants in the juvenile stage. Their wax uh, sort of has one type of one phenotype essentially. And then there's a shift that the plant undergoes. And after that, it produces leaves that have um, a different wax phenotype. And we wanted to know when does this shift happen, right? And in particular, does one wax type, the sort of alcohol wax type or the uh, triterpenoid wax type, the aliphatic wax type or the allocyclic wax type that is, 
does one of those types cover more surface area over time? Essentially, like, is one of them seem to be more important than the other, at least in terms of how long it's around during the lifespan of the plant and the, the total surface area of the plant? What does that look like? And so that was sort of the next experiment that we performed. <clears throat> we analyzed 74 leaves from, um, from sorghum plants of all sorts of different ages. And so I'll, we have the results, or I have the results here in this figure for you, and I'll try to explain it because there's kind of a lot going on. But the first thing that you should note is that there are little depictions of the plant here in the middle. So this is showing the plant from when it's very small all the way to when it's mature here. And each of these circles is representing the wax chemistry of the highest uh, ligulated leaf or the highest leaf that has a ligule on each of these plants. Okay, and there are some replicates, which is why we see like multiple points at each um, stage. So these green points down here are representing the highest leaves, the highest fully emerged leaves of plants between two to three weeks of age. They have a chemistry that on this y-axis here, we can see at the bottom, this represents the, uh, the essentially the juvenile leaf wax chemistry. So it's the aliphatic compounds, the alcohol compounds. And as a point is moving higher and higher up this axis here, up this y-axis, it has a chemistry that is more like the allocyclic uh, group. So it has more triterpenoids, right? And of course, on the x-axis, we have time. <clears throat> and so we can see that generally speaking, what we have here is a shift around 25 to 40 days after planting. And around that time, the sorghum plant switches from producing leaves that have juvenile chemistry to leaves that have adult chemistry or adult leaf wax chemistry. And there's um, you know, some intermediate kind of stages here as well, we can see. And so this is interesting, right? <clears throat> this essentially means that this leaf wax transition accompanies the overall like vegetative to reproductive sort of juvenile to adult transition that we see in a lot of plants. So leaf wax is part of this transition. Um, <clears throat> but another th the other question that I posed to you before we started the slide was, you know, does one of these types of wax cover the plant, cover more surface area of the plant over time? So we can answer that question as well. Here you can see each of these tracks on this lower portion of the plot represent one leaf and they're labeled leaf one, leaf two, leaf three, and so on. And you can see that some of these, you know, leaf one, two, and three like that are there very small. And so on this y-axis here, this is the leaf area. Those tracks are very thin. In fact, you probably can't even see some of them. Whereas some of these later tracks, the leaves get much bigger. You can see in the picture here, those leaves have a much greater surface area. So their tracks are considerably taller. And if we look at this plot overall, each of these tracks, I should say, is colored according to the same color scheme that these points are colored with. So the green is showing juvenile chemistry, the brown is showing mature leaf wax chemistry. And so we can see that, you know, by and large, the vast majority of sorghum leaf area over time is protected by triterpenoids, by these allocyclic compounds, the ones with the rings. So this is quite interesting. <clears throat> okay, we'll see. Um, so the next question that we had here, of course, because we're interested in comparisons between maize and sorghum, is we wanted to sort of move away from the phenotypic level and look a bit at the genotypic level. So we wanted to know what genes are enabling these triterpenoid waxes in sorghum that seem to be present for the majority of the plant's lifespan, but as I mentioned, are not present in maize. So what genes are making this possible? Well, we know from studies of other plant species, <clears throat> including the model Arabidopsis, that there is a type of gene, a family of genes really, called oxidosqualine cyclases. And these are responsible for making these triterpenoids, these compounds with the multiple rings. So we used um, <clears throat> the oxidosqualine cyclase, cyclase sequences from some other plants as queries with which to blast the sorghum genome. And we found 24 oxidosqualine cyclase sequences in the sorghum genome. Here they are shown, um, you know, next to a, or shown in a phylogeny, I guess, that relates them according to their sequence identity at the nucleotide level. And <clears throat> we looked at the expression levels of these different genes using public RNA-seq data. So we took 50 
public RNA-seq samples and looked at the expression of each of these genes in those samples. I should say each of these samples was a leaf sample from uh, BTX623, the sorghum um, sort of reference genotype. Uh, and, and here's what we found. We found that five of these uh, genes, five of these oxidosqualine cyclase genes had a median expression level that's shown by the little black bars which, within each of these violins. So each of, five of these genes had a median expression level that was above the mean expression level you know, of all the OSC genes. Of all these different genes, their mean expression level was here, this dotted line. And five of these genes had median expression levels that were above that mean. And so we considered these as top priority candidates for testing. And so we took those genes, we had them synthesized, and we put them into yeast cultures to see if we could get the yeast to, to with those genes, make triterpenoids, to make these compounds that are found on the, on, the, on, the, on the surface of the sorghum leaf. And so what did we find there? Well, we have here at the top, this, these, this is a, a, a chromatographic trace of the products that are found on the surface of the sorghum leaf. You can see we have beta amarin and alpha amarin, ferninol, and above all, we have this compound here, semiarinol. This is the one in sort of this tan color. And we have a little bit of isoarborinol that's also found on the surface of the leaf. This is, uh, in this panel here, is the yeast culture sort of that doesn't have any sorghum genes in it. If we give that yeast culture this first uh, sorghum uh, oxidosqualine cyclase gene, we can see that it makes beta and alpha amarin. So we're able to confer uh, beta and alpha amarin production to this yeast by giving it this sorghum gene. When we tested the next oxidosqualine cyclase gene from sorghum, we didn't see production of either of those two compounds, but instead we saw the production of this compound here. This is cycloartanol. It's interesting. This compound isn't found on the surface of the plant, but it is a precursor to steroid type hormones in plants. And so it seems reasonable that it's kept inside the cell if it's being used for making other types of physiologically important molecules inside the cell. Um, <clears throat> but the yeast is also able to do that, right? So the yeast is able to make this compound using that sorghum gene. And we'll come back to that in a minute. And there are two other sorghum genes that we tested that in yeast didn't seem to do anything. Uh, and this last one that we tested here, this one made semiarinol as well as ferninol, ferninol and isoarborinol. These are the major ox or, uh, triterpenoids present on the surface of the plant. And they're basically this compound here, semiarinol. This compound is the one that's protecting the majority of the sorghum leaf surface area over time. So it's sort of like the most important triterpenoid as far as protecting that leaf surface over the whole course of um, the majority of sorghum's lifespan and the majority of its surface area as well. So this gene, gene here became quite important to us, this semiarinol synthase, we call it, because it can synthesize semiarinol. Right. <clears throat> so with that important gene identified, we wanted to know what does the evolutionary history of that gene look like? And in particular, you know, is it present in maize? Because maize doesn't seem to be able to do this type of chemistry. And so, you know, did this gene, you know, sort of evolve after the divergence of sorghum and maize, or did maize lose that gene, or what happened here? So what we did was we mined six grass genomes for triterpenoid synthesis and constructed and annotated a phylogenetic tree showing those, uh, showing the oxidosqualine cyclases, the triterpenoid synthases, those two things are synonymous, showing those genes from these six grass genomes. And the genomes that we used were sorghum and maize, Cetaria italica, Cetaria viridis, Brachypodium, and Ariza sativa rice. <clears throat> and the way that we annotated this tree was by sort of highlighting it, or I should say like pointing to, with these little arrows, members of this phylogeny that have been functionally characterized. This means that either we or other groups have taken those genes and put them into some type of heterologous system, like, ye like the yeast that I showed you, or maybe into tobacco or something like that, to see what, <clears throat> what compounds those genes are capable of making. 
or I should see, I should say, what types of compounds the products derived from those genes are capable of making, right? Because it's the proteins that are derived from the genes that are actually doing the biochemistry here. But anyway, uh, you can see here, for example, then <clears throat> that this gene up here that ends in 800, it's making this compound here. This rice gene here that ends in 194, you know, its accession number ends in 194, it's making this compound here, and so on. Based on the, based on our knowledge of the function of these genes in this tree, at least, you know, the sort of eight or so that we have so far, two, four, six, eight, nine, um, we can see that, oh no, it is eight. Anyway, we can see that there's sort of two clades here. There's this clade down here at the bottom, clade one, it is making these compounds that have these little tails that stick out like this, right? So they have four rings and they have a tail that sticks out. These compounds are like the precursors to um, steroid type hormones in plants, particularly this one here, cycloartanol. In contrast, these genes in this clade up here that are labeled clade you know, 2A, 2B, 2C, and 2D, these genes up here are encoding catalysts that create other types of compounds, compounds that are not, um, you know, not along the lines of these compounds that lead to steroid type hormones down here. And so these, um, <clears throat> among these, I should say, are, are, are the semiaranol synthase here that we characterized. And so what does is, what is all this mean? <clears throat> we found two classes of synthases, right? One, oh, I should say, yeah, sure. One that has this steroid-like synthesis activity and one that has what appears, what might be like a derived activity, some type of divergent activity. And so to learn a bit more about that, we did what's called an ancestral state reconstruction. And so we took the sequences of the functionally characterized genes and we used them to try and predict what the sequences of the, the ancestral genes at each of these nodes along the backbone that have these little pie charts on them, what might the sequences of those genes be? And are those sequences more like these sterile synthases or are those sequences more like these, um, uh, these genes that are leading to the synthesis of other compounds? In particular, we're interested in this node here. This is the common ancestor of these two clades. And based on this analysis, what we found was that with pretty high certainty, we can predict that this ancestral gene functioned like the genes in clade one. That is, it was able to make these steroid type hormones and, uh, or the precursors to these steroid type hormones and not you know, some, something like uh, some other compound, like the compound we find on the sorghum leaf surface. And so it seems that uh, this clade here, clade one, is sort of has probably the ancestral function. And these other genes up here have some type of derived activity. And that includes sorghum leaf wax synthesis activity. <clears throat> so I talked to you about how we determined uh, sort of likely ancestral activity based on the characterized enzymes. <clears throat> and that this node here seems to have, uh, I should say, yeah, this node here seems to have strong signatures of sterile synthase activity. And so what this sort of suggests was, <clears throat> or I should say, this led to a new set of questions. This led to the question, was sorghum's wax tritropanoid synthase gene, this one here, was this one recruited from sterile synthesis from down here? So we suspect this is like a duplicate. There was like a, you know, there was a sterile synthesis at one, at one point. It was duplicated, and then that new duplicate, or perhaps the original, one of those two, became this gene up here that's sealing the sorghum leaf wax surface. And so we want to know, like, when did that happen? Was that, you know, before the divergence of maize and sorghum, which would mean that maybe maize got a copy of that duplicate, or did it happen after, and only sorghum has these two copies? <clears throat> what we did to answer this question was we looked in the maize genomes for homologs of this um, sorghum duplicate, this sorghum gene that is sealing the wax surface that seems to have been derived from the ancestral sterile synthase. And if we zoom in here, this is sort of meant to be showing some type of zooming in. Um, here's the sorghum gene. It ends, uh, it's like SOBIC008, da-da-da-da-da. 
<clears throat> it's this one here. And what this bar chart now is representing is the length of the longest open reading frame in that gene. So an open reading frame is like from the start codon to the stop codon. So it codes for a protein. And this one, this particular bar is colored in because this open reading frame has been characterized. So you can see the other um, bars that are colored in are referring to open reading frames that have been characterized. You can see right here in this tree, in this zoomed in portion, these accession numbers here, ZM, that stands for ZMAs. So these are little, what are annotated as genes in the maze genome that have really high sequence similarity to our sorghum gene of interest, right? Those haven't been characterized. Those little, um, those little bars are not filled in. And also those bars are a lot shorter than this bar here. What does that mean? That means that the longest open reading frame inside these maze genes is way, way shorter than the open reading frames that are present in these functionally characterized OSCs or these functionally characterized triterpenoid synthases. And this suggests that these genes might not be functional, right? So they have, uh, they have similarity in terms of their sequences, but in terms of the open reading frames they contain, they don't have a lot of uh, similarity as far as their length is concerned, which is important, right? That means if they made some type of protein that might do something, that protein is missing like half or two thirds of the amino acids it needs to do its job. So maize contains gene fragments with high homology to the sorghum wax gene. All right. So the next thing we did was we had a look at, um, we had a look at sort of, um, what we call syntenic regions in the, in the maize and sorghum genomes. Essentially the regions of the genomes that contain these genes we're talking about. And so we can see that um, they have, you know, they're kind of, uh, what's the best way to describe this? They have sort of like this, things come in the same order in those regions along the chromosome. And so you can see there's an ATG here, and then there is another, or I should say, these black lines represent uh, chromosomes. So this is a maize chromosome. Down here is a sorghum chromosome. Here we've got these little um, white boxes are representing genes. The black lines that are vertical on top of those white boxes are representing exons. And so here you can see in the maize gene, we've got ATG, then we've got a little later another exon and then another exon here. And those come in the same order as these little bits over here. So in the sorghum gene, we've got ATG and then coming this way, we've got another exon and another exon and so on. And you can see these little lines connect all the real little regions that come in the same order as we move down the chromosome. And so we can see really from this analysis that maize in fact has sort of two large gene regions, like these two gene models here, or these two little annotated bits of gene here, and these two over here, or I should say these three over here, each of those sets is, seems homologous with this sorghum gene that is functionally characterized um, with one sort of important exception, right? These little stars here. So these stars are indicating stop codons somewhere in one of the exons of these genes. And so it seems like uh, maize contains these fragments that are, you know, have high homology to the sorghum wax gene, and they're also in, an, in analogous positions along the chromosome. Right? So they're in sort of the same order as we walk down the chromosome. However, uh, the problem is that there are, see, let's go back there, sorry. <clears throat> the problem is that they contain these stop codons in there. And so they're, un they're unable to, to create full length proteins that might be able to synthesize these wax compounds. So our interpretation of this is that sorghum and maize both inherited this wax triterpenoid synthesis gene, right? Because they, they, you know, they both have copies that look highly similar. They're in similar configurations on the chromosomes. But uh, these, this gene doesn't appear to have been maintained in maize, although it does appear to have undergone some type of like inverted duplication, which is why we have two copies in maize. But neither, it seems, has been maintained. It's got these premature stop codons, and we went into the maize genome and PC, did PCR in these regions and sequenced those PCR products. And sure enough, these stop codons are, are real. They're there. They're not some artifact of, of um, genome annotation or something like that. 
And we can also look at public expression data and see that you know if someone sequences mRNA or RNA in general from a maize leaf, almost none of the reads that are obtained map to these particular exons. Right. So I'm sort of going to wrap things up here, um, but I'm going to do a little bit of review. So wax tritrypanoid synthesis in sorghum, we found, is likely carried out by what appears to be a neo-functionalized steroid biosynthesis gene. So it, there was a gene that was making steroids, <clears throat> or it was involved in steroid synthesis, steroid type hormone biosynthesis. It was, there was a, co a copy of that gene was created, and then one of those two copies sort of diverged and became capable of creating these leaf wax surf or these um, these leaf wax compounds and maize and sorghum both are inherited a copy of those and sorghum hasn't maintained those or sorry maize hasn't maintained <clears throat> the, that copy right so in sorghum but not in maize this genes activity has been maintained as part of the juvenile to adult transition and that seems to be enabling a triterpenoid rich cuticle on the adult leaves that protects the leaves over the majority of their lifespan. And so it seems like the maize leaf is here on this end of the spectrum, this aliphatic rich end, and the sorghum leaf is over here on the allocyclic rich end. And that maize uh, could have been on this end had it maintained this gene that we found. Right. And this is particularly interesting, right? Because we talked at the beginning about how things on this end of the spectrum, on the aliphatic rich end, seem like they might be less watertight at high temperatures, while things on the allocyclic rich end seem like they might be more watertight at high temperatures. So <clears throat> while, while we're still sort of working on nailing down the details of the structure function relationship, there is a fair amount of evidence to point. Uh, in this direction. And it's intriguing that this is a difference that underlies maize and sorghum. <clears throat> and so these are some of the questions that, that still sort of remain open here and that we're now looking to address, right? Are allocyclic rich wax layers indeed more watertight at high temperatures relative to this end of the spectrum? And does this apply to sorghum and maize? So these are the questions um, that we're working on. In particular, we would like to know, could that maize gene be resurrected to create a more allocyclic rich wax layer on that species? And would that leaf or would that plant with that resurrected gene be more drought resistant or be more resistant to water loss at high temperatures in particular? So these are some of the questions that we're working on answering in my new lab um, at the University of Minnesota Duluth. We have, I'm in the chemistry department. We have a new chemistry building here, the Heikola Center for Chemistry and Advanced Materials Science. Here's a picture of some of the labs. Um, I'm not sure if you've been to Duluth, but Duluth is a, a beautiful area. So please let us know if you ever come and visit. <clears throat> so with that, I, I will thank some of the folks that helped with the work here. In particular, uh, Liz Schmitz is someone who did an undergraduate in Nebraska who did a lot of the chemical analyses that I showed you today. Um, we have uh, <clears throat> uh, Dylan Cosma is someone that helped with chemical analyses as well. He's in Reno and uh, James Schnabel, uh, a comparative genetics expert in Nebraska who helped with some of the genomic analyses. I'd also like to thank uh, Edgar Cahoon, who is my mentor, my postdoc mentor while I was in Nebraska. And I'd like to thank the NSF who funded this work in the form of a postdoctoral research fellowship. If you're curious about um, the lab's work, you can check out our website here, thebustalab.github.io, or check us out on Twitter for sort of fun plant chemistry facts. Um, I'll thank you for your attention and I'll answer any questions that you have in the, in the Q&A session. So thank you very much.